Today, I'd like to introduce you to a relatively new friend of mine and very, very interesting man, Tony Gonzalez. Tony is based in the New York area and has and is a CISO and has been so of some Fortune 50 and Fortune 500 companies. It's been absolutely fascinating to get to know Tony and most notably 2023 CISO Connect top 100 CISO award winner as well, which as everyone knows is a peer-based award. Um, it's fascinating to uh, to catch up, Tony, and thank you for your time. Let's get straight into it. Um, when we really got talking, one of the biggest things we were talking about as a CISO challenge was sheer amounts of distraction and the sheer amount of things and challenges that you have to face. Let's explore and unpack some of those bits and pieces here. So tell me, what do you mean by distraction and noise from a purely from a CISO's perspective? Sure, Dan, and uh, it's, been, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, have this chat with you. Thank you. Um, you know, as a, as a CISO, there's, um, there's many things that um, are coming at you um, at a phonetic pace. Um, whether it's uh, internal requirements and needs, um, the general issues that pop up, uh, whether it's you know trying to stay on top of your security posture, um, and also now and ever increasing uh, the things that are coming up through third party partners uh, and to our, um, our regulatory requirements that are growing leaps and bounds uh, no matter where you are in the globe. Um, so it's a it's a real um, it's a real challenge is making sure is that what are you doing on a daily activity basis, weekly activity basis that's going to address the high priority items and also address the majority of those items. So how could you basically uh, take actions that are going to actually address multiple things if you can to be the most efficient and effective person in the job and to have your teams running most efficiently? Mm -hmm. But that's very interesting because, you know, in very large organizations, as we both know, uh, there's both blind sides of the organization, which is very hard to get visibility on. And then the deluge of data analytics. And as someone said to me yesterday, stuff on glass screens that is just constantly bombarding you. How do you even begin in such a scale organization to make sense of that? And then as we discussed as well, get away from that kind of tech focus and more business risk and prioritization because that is a really tough thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's always a multi-pronged approach, right? If you're focusing just on technology, uh, you know, you're gonna have uh, some issues. Um, my approach has always been the old people process and technology and doing in that order. Um, if you basically have a good, strong team in place, you can develop strong processes, um, which help you govern what's going on in the organization, whether it's related to cyber or just general IT controls and risk. Uh, and then using technology to be the most effective at doing that, uh, most effective as possible. Um, I think if you, um, if you look at those things, it's a matter of, having good plans in place and being ready to basically throw those plans out at any given minute because the unplanned is what's really the the, the real gotcha, right? Um, in our world, you know, uh, things are always dynamically changing. What you thought was going to be your priority two days ago may not be your priority tomorrow or even that same day based on the fact that um, the, the, the threat vectors are changing the uh, bad actors that are out there are constantly thinking of new ways of doing things to basically get in and either steal data or intellectual property. So um, you really have to be able to be quick on your feet and dynamically change as, as these things are changing around. But how do you keep on top of that? That's a question I get asked all the time. You know, how do your techies keep on top of this stuff? And, you know, we're inherently built into the system, but it's moving at such a pace when you are looking at that kind of scale and that kind of leverage how have you found what sort of methods have you used tony that's really helped you keep on ahead of that but without going down a rabbit hole and having to understand everything everywhere yeah i think i think you really have to have a good balance of again what your internal people are are working on and prioritizing 
um, and having a good network of advisors, right? Whether you look at um, um, the consulting arm, whether it's through threat analysis um, uh, sources, uh, keeping up on um, what agencies and um, and um, and others are basically providing from an information standpoint, so that you can determine what you feel is most um, what's going to be most egregious and what's going to be most um, impactful to your organization. You know, that's another factor that every CISO and every security professional has to take in mind is the fact that um, what might be, yes, there's a lot of commonality, but there are certain things that may be more impactful to one organization versus another, depending on what the organization's um, uh, sector is, right? Uh, certain sectors, depending on if you're heavily involved in um, utilizing and processing personal information and, and um, credit card information or whatever the case may be. Uh, yeah, everybody dabbles in a little, but there are organizations like healthcare organizations and insurance organizations where it's the lifeline. Right. If they have a breach, if they have a problem, it's going to it's going to be a big problem because it's much more impactful based on the thousands and thousands of people that they're shepherding and, and, and um, over, overseeing uh, the safety of that data. On that note, and it's very topical at the moment, there's a lot of debate going around in the forums about the requirements to report very quickly and mm -hmm. the balance of, you know, if, if if one was totally genuine, which one should be, there's still, you know, what do we say? Things become clear over time that may not be in front of you at the time. Um, there's obviously a great deal of seriousness around the law, of stock price, all those kind of things. How do you balance that? Because that is really tricky because you may not be with all the facts because you are in a genuine process of figuring out what's happened, whether it's real, what's the impact and so on and so forth. How on earth do you balance that? It's really important for everybody to have very strong relationships with their internal legal counsel, mm -hmm. with their privacy teams, with their chief risk officers, um, and making these things a business decision, not a CISO decision. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, yes, you need to provide them the information that says we've had a problem or we didn't have a problem um, and how egregious that problem is or how impactful that problem is um, and whether or not you have all the information or not. You need to disclose immediately to those folks and then say we might not have it. We might not have full information uh, for couple of days, a couple of months, whatever the case may be. Um, I've seen uh, in recent breach filings where some companies, it's taken them six months to figure out what the total impact to their organization really is. And um, it's a matter of knowing that once you really know it is a breach, that you report the full magnitude and how um, pervasive it is um, may may take some time. But if you, once you know you actually have a breach, because sometimes you can have something that is has some potential, mm. but it actually doesn't wind up being a breach because you had some sort of secondary controls or things like that that may have stopped it. Or you may have had a physical stop of those things. Um, it really winds up where, um, at that point in time, if you know nothing's happened, you may still want to report. We reported, uh, in the past, I've reported, um, we actually had a, uh, a process where we called it the near-miss process. So even if something wasn't an actual breach, we still reported it to all those internal folks. And then mm -hmm. the final decision of who to report to and when to report to that's in the hands of your legal and privacy officers who, who have that relationship with those regulators directly uh, in most cases. Um, or if you're the person in the company, then you know you're the person that has to basically do it then. But, um, you know, the, 
there's been um, everybody focuses on right now. They're focusing on in the United States. They're focusing on the new FCC law, which talks about you know a much tighter time frame of of reporting um, reporting um, incidents and breaches. Mm -hmm. But the um, there's been a number of state laws that have been around for a long time that have given you 24 hours or 72 hours to basically uh, to uh, do the reporting. Um, and many companies have taken the approach where we will report within those time frames, but the clock starts ticking once we know we've actually had that incident, right? And that's where there's some, I think, negotiation or there's some um, there's some gray line there um, where, you know, again, um, you have some opportunities there to basically take a, a small window of time to in, ensure that you actually did have that incident or that problem, and then then reporting it, and you would still be within a window of faith with the regulators as far as that goes. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, so many people define a breach. Well, the, the, how is a breach defined? Um, is it that you know some architecture? some solution, some business system has been compromised in some way, but not necessarily has PII gone missing? Were they able even to reach that? You know, where do you define a breach to be a breach versus an incident, Tony? What goes on through your mind in that respect? Because they may not have got all of the data. Defense and death often can stop that. Or even if they did get the data, they can't exfiltrate it anyway. I mean, that's really the difference between an incident and an actual breach, right? Mm -hmm. um, the actual breach is where you know, um, and depending on um, the regulator you're dealing with, um, you know, a breach could be very tightly defined as all it has to be is personal information of mm -hmm. a single person or a single entity, mm -hmm. uh, or it has to be um, under a certain number of records. Uh, in order for it to be a reportable incident, right? Mm. Uh, so that's the thing where it really takes um, making sure that you have that understanding in your organization and as well as in um, the risk organizations and the legal organizations to determine that so that you truly know what the what that difference is and have an internal have an internal uh, definition of those things, right? Because um, too many times, there's been, um, we talk about noise. Well, you also don't want to create a lot of noise in your organization because um, when you use the word breach and you use it in, in, in error, um, breach has a connotation that is very strong. Um, and in many cases, like you were saying, Dan, um, most of these issues wind up being incidents where um, something happened where a control failed, where there was potential for a breach, but the breach didn't actually occur, right? And that could be that could be something where a control fails, and it could even have something that involves human interaction. But you had things like. Um, DLP or other controls in place that basically actually stop them because it happened, you know, it was within the thresholds of something to be totally blocked and not not have an incident occur, right? Or not have a breach occur. So there's a lot of things that go into that analysis. It's not a straightforward, oh, we had an incident, yeah, this happened, okay, let's go report it type of thing, because in many cases, um, and that's why it's important that that decision gets made as a an organizational risk decision with those other people involved. Um, um, because um, as a CISO, you shouldn't be taking that on by yourself. And it truly is um, a risk decision. Um, Within the business of the CISO, in your view, is the advisor to that process and the interface yeah. to the organization to get that body of information yeah. together yeah i mean and usually you know if you're if you're basically the calling it flat out or strongly suggestion yes there was a problem that needs to be reported it gets reported absolutely
So there was a very interesting quote I read the other day popped in um, on one of my subscriptions and it was very interesting. It's easy to make good decisions early than suboptimal decisions later on down the line. That really does apply here, doesn't it? No. Interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, I think, yeah. Because again, um, you know, you need to, you need to take some window of time to evaluate number one, urgency, number two, scope, number three, mm -hmm. um, impact to the organization, right? You need, you need to, you need to take a little bit of time to understand those things. And sometimes that window of time could be very small, right? Um, I could think of a few instances where, uh, that window of time was hours. It wasn't days. Um, um, or, you know, um, and you, you sometimes do have to gather as much, as much fact as you can in a short period of time. And you do have to make an early decision. Um, making a decision early doesn't necessarily mean um, if it wasn't the right decision that it's going to cause you any problem. Um, it may cause, it may cause disruption. Uh, and you may, may, you know, if you do that too many times, there may be some questions about uh, oh, whether or not uh, you're doing the right thing. But, um, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you need to do those kinds of things. Um, and and the thing associated with those decisions is uh, really being able to articulate what it is that drove you to the decision. What were the facts that basically made you feel uncomfortable enough to basically take strong action? Mm -hmm. uh, and usually, if you can explain that and articulate that very well, um, most people will understand, especially senior leaders and, and board members and the like, who may not be up to the day to day, but um, but understand why you're making those decisions. There's a, a lot of times um, it comes down to one of the things on the periphery that we haven't talked about is what are you doing to educate the non-practitioner, right? Um, that's a very, very big, um, it's a very big issue. Um, I remember, um, in the past, um, showing some um, perimeter attack information to uh, a board, and they saw this and they said, "My God, you know, ninety thousand attempts on the perimeter—that's a huge amount in a year." And I said, um, "Not really, because the snapshot I'm showing you was a two-hour snapshot." Um, and then you saw the look on everyone's face and then people start to understand a little bit of the enormity of what you're up against. Let's talk about that because um, interestingly over my career in the only the recent years have I been pulled in to talk to boards. Um, there seems to be more of a an appetite for this and as you say people like to latch onto the numbers 90,000 you know over a year no one hour how do we how does the CISO get to build that relationship with the board so that they have the ear of the board the board trusts their judgment the communication lines are open and board to some degree is educated and treats that as a you know positive feed and source that it can trust because that's a challenge yeah it's it's um you know they there used to be an old joke about, um, you know, when you're when you're trying to turn an aircraft carrier, it, you know, it, you can't turn an aircraft carrier in minutes. It takes a long time to make that turn. And to me, it starts off with delivering to them what they're asking for. So you're proving to them, number one, you're listening, and number two, that you have the ability to deliver what they're asking for. Right. Then it's a matter of slowly over time changing that conversation to maybe not what they're asking for, but what's the message that you want to get across to them. Um, if you try to basically change the dynamic too fast and you haven't built that trust up with them yet, it can it can start to be a little 
it's confused, you know, and we have to, we have to put their hat on. It's confusing to them. Mm. Um, and then it gets frustrating to us because we think they're not listening. Right. So it, it's a, it's a, um, a longer haul relationship dynamic change that you have to basically influence. This also then goes into one of our past chats, which is around there are some CISOs um, who have grown up through the technical pathway and others through the business risk compliance pathways. And there are differences. There's pros and cons in each. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I think it's really important. You, you know, when we then mix that with people who love data, what are the dangers around that, Tony? And then map that to the board for me here. You know, what have you done that's been very different to sort of take that view and suppress and keep high high level and high picture on things and why is that being really effective? I think um, you know in the when you when you're in the seat nowadays, um, there's a growing there's a growing number of um, growing number of, of information and things and needs that are being asked of a CISO that are more in that risk compliance area and governance and the business side, right? Mm -hmm. um, and rightfully so, because um, I think you see with most successful CISOs nowadays, it's because they've been able to take care of that technical side and take care of those things that are basically risks to the organization. Um, and sh they've shown how they're able to enable their businesses to do what they want to do, right? So when you look at you look at most businesses, they're they're you know, how are businesses trying to uh, grow, right? They either grow through acquisition, or they grow through um, internal growth. Internal growth usually means thinking of new markets to get into, thinking of new ways to basically provide services to their customer base, um, uh, to drive that customer relationship or to um, basically tap into markets that they had been tapped into previously. Um, in order to do that, most businesses are looking to use technology to do that nowadays because everybody has a, uh, a limit on headcount. They have a limit on, on you know, their ability to basically, um, you know, gather the right information to make those right decisions. So they're looking at technology. Um, if you look at most of the, uh, most of the things that drive that, they're either SaaS solutions that the businesses are looking into. Um, you know, obviously cloud comes along with that. And then you have um you have um you know the the new disruptor on the on the lips of everyone, which is AI, right? And and I call it a disruptor because again, if you look at cloud was a disruptive technology. There's been numerous disruptive technologies. And why are they disruptive? Because they're not dis they're disruptive from the point of they drive you to make changes to your organization and the way you think about things and the way you do things, right? And AI is definitely one of those that's on everybody's mind right now. And it's not about whether you're going to use AI or not. It's about how you use it and when you use it, and being selective of how you use it. That's actually going to drive some business for you. Um, because you you should always be weighing out and explaining things through some sort of risk and rewards scenario, right? Um, if there's a use of the technology with little reward but high risk, you need to basically give that to your senior leaders and see if that fits their risk appetite and that's what they really want to do it, right? Um, if it's um, if it's something that's going to add great value. Then it's up to us to basically say, okay, here's how we can put some guardrails around that so you can effectively use it and basically drive the business to where it wants to be. 